Now, we have here, um, Liam, you're, you're in, in an interesting sort of alternative space. <laughs> so we'll see what your take on this is. I'm meant be. to be tomorrow night. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's an interloper from, from stories? Stories and page, apparently. Stories and page. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Um, Liam, uh, I think we talked together 15 years ago or something. Yeah. First year Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Long time ago. And much has happened since. But um, it's fantastic to have you here, here particularly in the flesh from, from the US of A. Um, Ayal, you, you had a, a stint teaching here. And in fact, you came up in relation to the first evening. Uh, Schumann talked about sitting around the table and the people you brought to that table. And I saw that as a really excellent... I suppose parallel to what the school really is needing to do in terms of bringing different voices and a curated set of voices and what those could, could really achieve. Um, Muiwa, I'm very excited to have you here, incoming president to the RIBA, yeah. um, which is an extraordinary opportunity to engage in a conversation about what and why we educate, how might we be educating for the profession, and then perhaps most importantly, you are kind of an excellent example of what action can do to change the conversation about a, a really a, a historic institution. Yeah. Then, um, I might just jump to our lovely uh, people on screen. Uh, I think we've nailed the, the technological issues. Um, Matthew Gandhi, I, I'm assuming you're in Cambridge, but you may not be. He's nodding, nodding. Um, part of the geography department, but I think very well aligned to some of the objectives of certainly some of the units here. I know you've done work with people like us many times before. Um, Rana Haddad, are you, are you with us from Lebanon? Yes, from Lebanon. Fantastic. Um, I will certainly, you know, active, in action, on site, I would imagine. But uh, we'll come to you when we can manage the technology a little bit. And then uh, our two representatives from Space Caviar, Sophia and Joseph. Lovely to, lovely to meet you. So I'm going to kick off because we have many of you and a handful of slides. And I'm going to start with Ayal. We're going to move somewhat thematically through, through our panel. And uh, we'll kick off. I've got control of the clicker. Oh my goodness, you know what? I didn't fail to look, look left. Yulika Gitna, who I've known for many years, um, is absolutely on the sort of the street side of things, so that's what I, I consider. And Graham Shane, who I, I hope is a familiar name to you all. Hope so. so <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for the reminder. Between the, the one side of the room and the other, and uh, the screen, I'm obviously easily confused. Great, I'm going to hand the clicker to you, Al, and then. Oh, okay. The honor uh, is yours. <clears throat> is it like a presentation? I, whatever you would like to talk to your slides. Um, For about way. five minutes, I suppose. Something like that. Um, okay, so I'd like to speak to this one particular slide. Um, this is the door to uh, our office in Ramallah. Um, we opened uh, the Office of Forensic Architecture uh, in Ramallah about a year ago. Uh, as a collaboration with the biggest human rights organization there, called al Haq. Uh, a few weeks after we opened the office, this organization has been designated a terrorist organization by the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Um, the evidence that were provided were not accepted by any government. In fact, they weren't even accepted by the CIA. Uh, we've helped provide the evidence internationally to that. And uh, what is that? A month and a half ago, uh, the Israeli military raided our office, broke in through the front door, blasted it off the, its hinges. Um, we have installed some CCTV cameras in anticipation of that raid. Uh, we can see the soldiers. I don't know if it's here or not, so I'll just kind of like conjure it in, in words. Um, the army is going in, um, you know, usually when you have raids over terrorist organizations, and, you know, now we are officially designated a terrorist group uh, in that country. Uh, you have the military going to look for explosives or uh, guns. Here what they were looking for are 
documents, uh, sketches. We were working at the time on uh, on an investigation, a number of investigations there, including the Israeli army uh, murder of a Palestinian journalist, the Al, uh, Al Jazeera journalist uh, called Shirin Abu Akla. Um, I don't know if that was the reason for the raid, but that was definitely uh, amongst the things that were sieved through. And I want to start my proposition with showing that architectural drawings uh, analysis, um, you know, not much of it is really on paper, and whatever was online uh, can definitely be accessed without physical access. So, with all these caveats, still start the kind of the conversation with showing that to some extent when you take architectural uh, and politics and activism seriously and you pursue that and now uh, forensic architecture uh, research agency that we run and provides evidence in many many countries we've undertaken over 85 investigations all over the world in Mexico and in Colombia we worked for the Truth Commission we work for the International Court uh, of justice in The Hague and in the European Court of Justice. We work outside of courts for people's tribunal and social movement. Uh, we're providing evidence for state murder and uh, other form of state crime. And that makes um, sometimes what you produce uh, dangerous for states and, and dangerous for our staff. Uh, so it kind of, uh, you know, takes up the stakes a little bit in, in terms of the work uh, that is that is being done. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what is, yeah, this is our, uh, if I press again, you'd see the CCTV uh, on the, the CCTV footage uh, that uh, outside the office, uh, you'd see the soldiers breaking in through the entrance door of a church that occupies the ground floor of this, uh, of this office. I, I cannot like speed it up, but, you would see them moving up the stairs, um, entering into the front door. And what you've seen at the start was actually that they have brought, after after breaking in, into the office. Okay, it needs some remodeling, the office, I understand. <laughs> but um, um, after that, uh, they've actually welded the door shut with a, with a steel sheet. Um, again, you know, we, uh, Right now, the forensic architecture is opening offices in different places in the world. We, we have an office in Berlin that works on neo-Nazi crime uh, in Germany. We, we have a work and a partnership in Ukraine uh, that is working uh, there and, uh, and through our office in Berlin. Uh, we've opened an office in Bogota, uh, in Mexico City, in the banlieue in Paris and in other places because we want to bring that kind of work to contact directly uh, with the uh, frontline communities that are experiencing and resisting through investigating uh, these crimes. Uh, so this is just something very fresh, I thought, to show uh, in that context. What, what else? Uh, this is, yeah, this is the note on the door saying uh, that it's closed for uh, security reason and as, as part of us being a terrorist uh, group. Uh, this is, uh, there's been six other Palestinian organizations that have been designated terrorist organizations, all of them civil society organizations. Uh, Defense for Children International, um, an association that protect uh, women, uh, agricultural workers. I think this is the Health War Committee. Uh, this is a research center. Uh, all, all of these doors are welded shut. Um, this is the door of our office. I leave it at that uh, as a kind of starting proposition, Fantastic. and Fantastic. We, we, we move on. Fantastic. I had next on my list uh, Matthew, I think. I'm grab oh, sorry. Sure yeah. Right oh, one well, lost. Which? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, can people hear me? Yes, very much so. Okay, that's great. Well, th thank you for inviting me. Um, I just thought I'd say um, a few very uh, brief remarks. Um, this image actually is taken in Berlin, and it's um, um, a, a so-called Bracha or, or wasteland uh, on, a, on a street corner where the Berlin Wall 
uh, once stood, uh, which is a, a site that I studied very intensively um, for around 10 or 12 years. Um, it's now been uh, replaced with a, a luxury apartment block called The Garden with uh, special um, security features. Um, so I was recently thinking about the question of ecological uh, nostalgia uh, and how we try to make sense of these very um, special places within cities where uh, biodiversity um, flourishes. And I just wanted to say a few quick remarks about um, my, my new book, um, Natura um, Urbana, um, Ecological Constellations uh, in Urban Space, which is my attempt to bring together um, actually several years um, of thinking about urban nature and trying to make sense um, of this uh, very uh, vibrant and fast changing um, field. And in writing this um, book, I felt that perhaps we could consider um, urban ecologies in terms of uh, four um, intellectual, intellectual or professional um, strands. Um, um, a first um, strand um, I've referred to as um, systems-based approaches, uh, which is by far the dominant approach across um, architecture, landscape design, and other fields, and really um, assumes uh, that the city uh, is um, a bounded um, object of analysis, and the, the epistemological unity between the social and physical sciences and so on is an un unproblematic goal, this kind of epistemological unification in terms of a systems-based approach uh, with different um, points or possibilities of, of intervention. Um, a second um, paradigm, um, looking across the field and across the literature, um, I would refer to as observational paradigms. Um, certainly going back to the 19th century and a, a grassroots or street level and um, fascination uh, with unusual ecological assemblages uh, in cities, particularly led by urban botany, but ornithology, entomology uh, and other fields. And possibly we can trace a strand here with contemporary fascination with um, citizen science and um, increasingly sophisticated notions of um, um, everyday or public involvement in the collection of data and also a sense, a sense of um, a joy and exhilaration in terms of non-human others and their presence within urban space. A third strand uh, with which my own work has been quite, quite closely associated, um, I would refer to as um, urban political ecology uh, with a very particular input from neo-Marxian studies um, of capitalist um, urbanization. And certainly this field itself uh, is in a, in a process of uh, change and development. Um, I've been fascinated for many years in, uh, in Isle's uh, work uh, on forensic architecture, and I've been playing with the notion of forensic ecologies as a potential um, synthesis between strands of forensic architecture and forensic entomology and the use of specific organisms um, to actually um, enable the tracing of environmental change at different um, spatial um, scales. And certainly citizen science can also um, feed into this notion. And in very broad uh, conceptual terms, when people look puzzled by the notion of urban political ecology, I could simply refer to the notion of following the money and understanding um, which specific interests benefit from uh, violence against nature and defenders of nature. Uh, so important uh, intellectual strands coming together here. And then perhaps the fourth and most recent element in terms of this broad-based um, typology, um, I would refer to as the ecological um, uh, pluriverse, uh, bringing together a range of different perspectives uh, in terms of acknowledging and appreciating uh, non-human others or other uh, denizens of urban space with also profound um, ethical uh, implications. And uh, if we, for a moment, consider how the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic was in many ways traced back um, to the structures of global food production, um, agro-capitalism, and the destruction of biodiversity hotspots, creating zoonotic frontier zones uh, that threaten uh, global health. Uh, so I think we need to think about questions of um, urban nature then and urban landscapes in terms of a broader um, set of um, coordinates or uh, relations. 
So, uh, yeah, thanks very much. They're just a few um, opening remarks. That's a, that's a fantastic, also it overlaps a lot with some of the comments that we were discussing a few days ago, um, just in terms of the extension of our realm. And I think ties in relatively well to you, Liam. <laughs> yeah, okay. everything ties to Liam. Of course, everything ties to Liam. Um, okay, do I need a thing? I think okay. Uh, can you pass me that? Yeah. Um, so this is the first time I'm back in the building since, or well before the apocalypse, and um, the the last incarnation that that I had in this building was as a studio instructor um, running Diploma Six with Kate Davies uh, sitting right there, um, called Unknown Fields, and oh, let me play this thing. Point over there. Point over there. Um, and in the context of the theme tonight, I guess. What's useful to think about is that the work of Unknown Fields was really an attempt to understand a place like the AA or, or a city like London, not just by looking at the contingencies of this particular place and site and its immediate adjacencies and the street outside the door, but rather to see this building, to see this city as caught within a planetary scaled network of supply chains, cables and systems. And what we would do in, in the studio is, is take a group of students and in its most recent incarnation as a, as a research studio, take documentary crews on rather ambitious, often perilous journeys, tracing these planetary supply chains from here in London all the way back to the hole in the ground where a city like this begins its life. And I mean, what you're seeing here on the screen is a film uh, called Unraveled that is following an actor playing a young Indian textile worker who's walking slowly on a sacred possession from her home village amongst the cotton fields through the vast textile mills, um, factory floors, um, packaging operations, and, and finally the, the shipping ports that ultimately export her and everything we wear to the West. And what we're trying to do here is is you know, talk about the procession that so many women like her have made in moving from factory, f from village to factory to city, but at the same time, the journey that almost all of the clothes that we wear takes in moving um, from from village to factory to city and then to this city. Um, so what what we're trying to do, in a way, is is we make films and we animate stories that exist along these these planetary systems um, to try and talk about our world as as really an entirely constructed entity you know we, we used to use this dichotomy of nature and technology we used to think about um, cities and country as being unlike things I guess the work of unknown fields is trying to map this continuous planetary scaled city um, that exists across the entirety of the earth um, but we would do so not through the use of urban diagramming and large-scale mappings or satellite imagery that, that might be native to the theme of space, but rather through storytelling, through documentary making, and, and through films like this that, that believe in, in the ways that um, uh, the power of fiction, but also aesthetic practice, has the capacity to cut through some of that planetary-scaled complexity and allow people to connect it in ways that they couldn't do um, kind of an architectural drawing or diagram. Um, and I guess that was the starting point of, of, of my journey beyond... Um, uh, could we kill the sound? It's a bit, it gets a bit intense. Um, uh, my journey out of uh, the AA, um, on the eve of Brexit, I escaped to Los Angeles uh, and to Hollywood, um, following this interest in the power of stories and trying to look at ways that um, stories can become an accessible medium to almost like Trojan horses to convey these complex ideas about cities and our planet to audiences that don't normally show up in rooms like this, right? Like, you know, we, we come to an institution like at the AA and we, we study for five or six years learning the coded languages of plan sections, urban diagrams. Um, it's a very privileged medium. Uh, but ever since we can sit up, we're put in front of the TV, we fall asleep in the pages of a novel, or um, we spend our Friday nights in front of the flickering movie screen. Um, there's a way that in, in context like this, we often use the term accessible as a derogatory term, certainly in the art world, but we're really interested in the way that 
aesthetics practice and fiction can help us to connect with a lot of the ideas that other people on the panel might be dealing with. Um, so particularly here, we're looking at a, a, a new film of mine called Choreogra Choreographic Camouflage, where the same systems of surveillance and tracking that is used to optimise these planetary supply chains is now um, being rolled out at urban scales in, in streets, particularly in places like Hong Kong in the protests where protesters are wearing masks either for COVID or to protect themselves from tear gas and the Chinese government is using um, gate detection algorithms or body detection um, software to map the proportions of the body. Um, and here what we're doing is working with a choreographer called Jacob Jonas to develop a series of movements, a, a new dance vocabulary that would be designed to distort the silhouette of the body and the, and the, symmetric, the symmetry of the body or entangle two bodies into one um, so that the figure disappears to the eyes of those um, state-sponsored algorithms. Um, so part of the project is literally using the same um, data sets and um, the same code that, that the state operationalizes at the scale of protests um, in order to create these these new kind of movements. So in the in the film you see mapped across the body is the the, the line work of the algorithm attempting to understand and read um, the quote unquote normal figure um, and the point at which it blurs or um, distorts is its is its failure to to, to read the body based on um, these new kind of entanglements that we started to design. Um, and then finally, um, this work is, is probably our most recent piece. Um, it's, it's currently at the London Film Festival, um, opens tomorrow night if anyone wants to see it, um, where we're literally taking the, a lot of the research that might have begun with, with Kate and I in Unknown Fields and, and again project it as the, the largest scale urban fiction we could possibly imagine, in this case the redesign of the entirety of the Earth. Um, this is a film called Planet City, which is a single city for 10 billion people, the projected global population of the world in 2050. And here what we're trying to do is create another kind of fiction of total planetary urbanization. In this case, um, we worked with a whole series of philosophers, um, economic theorists, um, urbanists, scientists, technologists to, to design the densest possible envelope that could contain all of the world's population. Um, in this case, a single city about the size of Texas that would allow us to return almost the entirety of the world's resources, uh, the entirety of the world's planet, um, entirety of the world's landscape uh, back to, to nature, to wilderness. Um, so the city occupies 0.02% Earth. Um, so it's a radical consolidation of the type of planetary sprawl that, that Kate and I have been mapping through our film work in Unknown Fields gets condensed into this single urban gesture um, as a means to relieve the pressure on the rest of the planet, to return the planet almost to a, you know, not a romantic ideal of nature, but rather a giant carbon sequestration machine. Um, but hopefully it's a, it's a good summation of the way that we've been operating, which is to use stories, in this case a thought experiment for a, you know, a provocative urban form, um, to, to think about the real fiction which is taking place here, which is not the fiction to put everyone in one place, but rather the fiction to continue with business as usual in the planetary scaled city that we currently all already occupy. Yeah. Thank you, Liam. I, I like the idea also that um you know, once your unit split up, Kate went to the woods and you went to L.A. <laughs> so, so you've created that sort of a divergence. It says more about yeah. both of us than you could possibly imagine, <laughs> yes, exactly. actually. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think this is, this is a, it's a very nice moment to start to tie together what it means also, what the significance of documentation is and its nature, which we can keep coming back to. Um, you can click forward or um, and I'll pass on. You're over to Graham. I hope this makes logical sense, or you feel that there's a, a logic in it. <laughs> uh, well, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure this will make logical sense at all, but um, uh, about 60 years ago, I stood here to present my thesis to the, with Gowan and Peter Cook as fifth year master and a whole gang of uh, Corbusians ready to tear me to threads. 
and I was uh, taught, I was one of the first uh, Archigram fifth year studios. And um, so what I've got up is uh, really very local and um, historic. And uh, I was very influenced by Joseph Rickworth, the idea of the city. So the top left hand, uh, uh, Gowan was my thesis advisor. Peter was the year master. And Gowan used to see me last thing at night, and he would not turn the lights on in the, stu in the room. It was one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, afterwards, he would take me for a drink in the bar, which not everybody could go into in those days. And um, I had already done RIBA part two, because 1968 was the year of student revolutions. And so they loaded us up with the RIBA <coughs> technical requirements to keep us quiet and out of trouble. We were also fighting against joining Imperial College Science and Technology. Apologize for all this history. Okay, and then, um, so we, I did have an amazing tutor in fourth year from Arabs who was building uh, oil rigs and thought my little long spans were nothing. And then I had another tutor who was from right out of Louis Kahn's office and wanted all these little geometric pavilions, and I'd been in the States. So I had this big, uh, deep, urban layering system of, um, based on Team 10. And then I had uh, Cedric Price on top of it. So what you have is uh, the sort of enclave of the city as uh, envisaged by uh, Rickwort, but m my interpretation with these different urban actors, with their different pieces, uh, instruments that they could devise to control the city, uh, with gates and su supervision and carceral uh, systems. And it was uh, based on a chess set. And then I applied it to the city of London and I used the Fleet Valley, uh, Farringdon Street, with the section based on uh, Team 10, and, I was react and then I took the scale from the Farringdon Market and put it as a greenhouse down the street. Now, this may seem to you completely mad. Uh, it was what we did back in the day. And Liam, you know, we were treated like we were mad. And <laughs> it was crazy stuff. And, um, but in a way, we were trying to see the urban future and some sort of flexible uh, methodology. I had a whole kit of parts that were, came out of Christopher Alexander and Archigram, and these were color drawings originally. I drew in a notebook uh, tiny drawings, and Gowan said to me at the end of the year, hey, Graham, what are you going to do for the final? And I said, mm, I'll draw it up. And he said, no, no, the, we, this is Gowan, Sterling and Gowan. We have a cameraman on Fleet Street. He takes Jim's drawings that are the size of a postage stamp, and you can blow them up and put them up on the screen. And I did it, and I had um, music as well, downtown where the lights are bright and uptown. So if you look, there's a whole system of public space that's being choreographed in there. And um, I don't know, it was a very optimistic Beatles, Rolling Stone time. And we didn't envisage that Mrs. Thatcher was going to come and get us within <coughs> three years. I mean, you know, it was really something else. Anyway, to go on very quickly, uh, you have the idea that this is from AA125, uh, Gowan made a collage out of my projects, which was beautiful. I wrote a little catty comment about what I thought was happening. And uh, then I went on from that. I was unusual. Only two people from my year went on to a further degree. Uh, Robin Evans, my best friend, and I, I, we were accepted by Joseph Rickworth at Essex, but I had an American girlfriend, and so I went to Colin Rowe in Cornell, which was really very different. <laughs> and um, what I, 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 went, I landed in Cornell, and I had hair out to here, dressed all in black cowboy boots. And uh, Colin 
uh, didn't know what to do with me. And I started, I, I'm not going to go on too long, but I started, uh, he wanted to do figure ground. I'd had all these tutors from uh, Khan's office, and I just told him after three or four weeks, this is BS, I'm not going to do this. And a big silence in the studio. Then he said, what would you like to do? Uh, and then it, I said, well, I want to study London. And he did this thing, he was British, carry on. It was like out of a movie. And um, he never spoke to me for the rest of the semester. I was in the doghouse. Meanwhile, he's writing to Alvin, who's doing the first summer session, this whole experimental thing for 1970. Uh, Shane will come with me and pin up his drawings. I'll get Jim and everybody to come and look. And I was taking London apart into fragments and streets and flow systems and it was very much about systems and uh, about land ownership and property maybe even social justice but also the ecology the landscape where the uh, hidden rivers were this was way before anybody wrote about hidden rivers there was one book about hidden rivers and i took i did covent garden to begin with because i was the history witness against the glc highway that they wanted to cut through there that the Smithson supported and uh, we stopped it and I worked with Covent Garden Community Association for that and then I wrote about contextualism coming out of that in a very broad sense and when I did it everybody later attacked contextualism but I got a note from Rem and a note from Bernard saying we don't mean you it's okay <laughs> And if you look at his lecture, Bernard has a big X. So it's not only what you have around you of the context, it's also the bigger systems. And so, you know, I felt okay. Anyway, Bernard became the dean at Columbia. I got there before him. And he put me in charge of urban design in 1990. So I was very grateful for that. But anyway, uh, I did my PhD on the streets, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, and, but it was very historic and um, not at all futuristic as compared to what I had done um, with, um, with Gowan. And so I'm going on quickly. Oh, back one way. And then, uh, so I taught for 10, 15 years uh, in Colombia. Uh, the program in urban design went from five students to 50 in five years. It was complete insanity of enormous amount of work, but incredibly exciting. And then I really hated administration. I never really wanted that. And so I sort of stepped down and in 2000 and I started to travel. But uh, these diagrams, uh, about urban systems uh, uh, layering up on each other. We used to listen, this, I'm talking about Rem and Bernard and all of us in the summer sessions. Uh, Alvin used to do this lecture about layering of Chicago with the skyscrapers and everything and about the power of that economy. And um, uh, we all took it in. It was like the wa in the water. And uh, so I have these different ecological urban systems that are, some of them are linked and some of them are removed. And, uh, I, and I was very into what I call the meta city with the handheld and the satellite. This is coming from Archigram. So uh, uh, I sort of carried that forward and then I got into the, uh, all this Foucault and French theory. So the heterotopia of illusion, which Foucault talked about and which Barth talks about in terms of uh, the building of the Pompidou. So there's this whole other world that opens up of display, uh, information, and activity uh, in the city. With a, and uh, because I became mobile after 2000, I was actually started going to, I had a lot of Asian students already and I, st I watched China take off. It was an unbelievable thing to, and I was there. And I felt very, very privileged to do that and made some very good friends. Uh, anyway, urban design 
since 45, my second book uh, was 2011, and that uh, was much more ecological, urban ecology thing, math more like Matthew. Uh, but, you know, I'm old, I'm not on the front line like these guys. So that was, this is my own urban journey. Uh, and uh, I ended, this is just to finish it. Um, you know, we've been in lockdown basically for two and a half years. My daughter, who is a puppeteer, who worked on 42nd Street with Children's Theatre, was in lockdown. And then now, and she was up with us in the country and uh, tried, to, and now she's back in action. So our apartment got turned into a manufacturing point for the invasion of little. Amal into New York for two weeks, which is this huge media event. So it's the Meta City as well. And at the same time, they also visited the homeless. At the top left, Amal went around 42nd Street. So, and then they invaded the, with the Occupy people, they invaded the bull of, of uh, Wall Street. And these masks were manufactured in our living room. Anyway, it's just that the local, global, and everything goes together. And I'm humbly thanking you for having me. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry. I think the coincidence is extremely good. Yeah, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I didn't know what to do with foresight. <laughs> but and okay. with this company, I mean. I think this actually ties very well into the two of you, Space Caviar. Um, can we hear you? You're muted, but... Um... You're on mute. Yeah, but can you hear us now? Yes, very much so. <laughs> we, we wanted to share our screen. I don't know if you can see. Yes, we can. Oh, no, I okay, can. Okay, great. Hang on one second. I can on the... Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, um... We wanted to show uh, an image from our days back at AA, where I was a student of Joseph Grima at um, Crypto Architecture, a studio, intermediate, I don't 14, remember, 14. I think it was 14, yeah. It must have been like 2015 to yeah. 17, uh, more or less. So this was actually where we met, um, not literally, <laughs> but I think in, uh, yeah. um, if nothing else, um, intellectually kind of on this uh, floating down the route, the Gan uh, Ganges and Varanasi. Um, Creating but, selfie stick architecture. Exactly. But in, in a way, I think the, the image, in a way, captures uh, a certain uh, aspect of what we do um, in the sense that um, we are very interested in technology, but not so much as a lot of our work actually involves um, technology, but I think you could describe it as, in a way, kind of dirty, uh, dirty technology. Like we, we're interested in um, technology in the to the extent that it is um, becomes a kind of a place of encounter or an instrument of um, transformation of space. Um, and so we're very interested in the way that um, the kind of um, technologies that are so central to everyday life have much broader implications than are um, often uh, considered in, at least within the architecture world. Um, yeah. This is an image from um, an exhibition that we are just showing now, uh, the Triennale Milano. It's an exhibition called Unknown Unknowns. And it's looking at the sort of unknowns, especially of the universe and of outer space. And um, this image here is an artwork by Thomas Arceno that's part of the exhibition. And at first, when you encounter the thing, the space or see this image, you might think that it's a looking into the galaxy, into outer space. Um, but in fact, it's just a light in a room picking up all of the dust. Um, and so this sort of tension between these large scales and the kind of microscopic of like uh, being on the street or on the ground um, was really interesting to us. And yeah, this is also another um, image from uh, the same exhibition, actually. We were, uh, the exhibition was curated by Ercilia Valde, who's an astrophysicist. So um, it was really the product of a very long conversation between uh, science, uh, contemporary design practice, uh, and art. 
Um, and in a way, I think that's a methodology that's really central to our work. I, I think we consider ourselves architects not so much in the sense of um, a kind of an association with um, building, um, shaping the built environment, uh, but much more in the sense of creating opportunities and um, places of encounter for networks. Um, and so uh, we tend to collaborate quite intensively on all of our projects um, with many people who are actually not um, architects or designers themselves. We work uh, a lot with artists and actually behind us here we have a photograph of Armin Linke who's um, another uh, artist who we've collaborated with extensively on um, many uh, research projects. Um, but the the exhibition in Triennale for us, so we, we try to use each of the projects that we um, work on in, as a form of research um, in itself and kind of thinking about uh, ways in which the um, application of technology to well-known um, challenges such as in this case the exhibition design can be uh, an opportunity, can push the boundaries towards something, a, a completely new approach to the problem. Uh, and in this particular instance, we were um, we collaborated with WASP, which is an Italian uh, company that makes architectural scale 3D printers, um, to really try to see whether it was possible to um, deploy a completely different set of materials in the context of um, an, a, a museum exhibition. Um, and so in the end, we, um, we ended up uh, 3D printing all of the display system on site um, with these big 3D printers that kind of moved through the space using Earth, which was uh, kind of the, really the most the, the most abundant and the poorest material uh, um, that uh, also has a very long history in, in the history of architecture, uh, but using a completely different sort of um, material language. And in this case, it was mixed with rice waste um, from Rice House, which is a local company also that uses um, waste from the production of rice, which is a food very... Like literally risotto, <laughs> yeah. which is Important like a, a typical Milan. Milanese dish. Um, but the, the, I think the thing that was uh, significant for us in uh, the process of this exhibition, the, and I think the reason um, I think that we uh, use it as a, as a kind of example of the way that we work is that it was uh, an extreme collaborative effort. There were literally hundreds of people um, involved in... Um, aside from the artists who are on display, but in the uh, production and the uh, conception of the way in which this um, material could be used in this context was a very um, transversal, horizontal uh, group effort um, that actually opened up the possibilities for um, uh, you deploying systems like this. I mean, one of the reasons we were interested in this was because exhibitions can, uh, even exhibitions that are specifically on the subject of um, waste and of, um, I don't know, sustainability and so on, tend to actually be incredibly wasteful themselves. And <clears throat> the idea of being able to kind of source uh, materials like incredibly locally was um, for us quite uh, uh, an interesting challenge. And then the exhibition afterwards can be simply ground up and returned to the earth. So there's also uh, this idea of not creating waste in the exhibition. And another recent project um, that we just finished, these are all projects all from last June. June. Yeah, from well, <laughs> well, the last six months. months. Last, yeah, the last couple of months. months. Um, but uh, this is a project that we worked on uh, for the stage of Terraforma Festival, which is a music festival here in Italy. Um, and the story began, I guess, in 2018 uh, for the, during the Via storm, which damaged over 45,000 hectares of important forests in northern Italy. Um, and and, the, and this was part of a long multi-year sort of, we're, we're, I think we're also very interested in the idea of um, a kind of uh, temporary um, urbanism uh, applied in a, a, a sporadically. There's another project we work on called Alcova, which is also a kind of a temporary activation of certain portions of the city of Milan. Um, because it provides uh, space within the heavily regimented space of uh, sort of permanent production, uh, many loopholes are possible if things um, occur uh, sporadically. Um, and that was the case with this uh, festival. But on the other hand, we're also interested in um, the ways in which uh, sort of nominally temporal events can yeah. leave a permanent trace. So in fact, 
the first stage of this collaboration with them was uh, with them was a multi-year uh, process of replanting um, an area of uh, the city of Bollate, which is just outside Milan, which is where the, the festival takes place. Uh, again, using this um, sort of uh, architectural intervention as an opportunity for collaborative action with a very large group of people, like really um, making the uh, production of the festival's infrastructure into uh, a collaborative action um, for the community of both the participants of the event and also participants of the surrounding community. And in a way, we're also interested in architecture at the scale of of the planet at the scale of a forest or a landscape but also in this case like the architecture that we were growing that we were looking for had a really long-term view it was some this forest that was planted is something that will perhaps be used for future festivals but in many many years ahead so kind of adding this really long-term thinking into the way we design and this was the um, outcome of a um, more or less one week workshop in which the wood from that was and as you can imagine, with the, in the storm of 2018, there were hundreds of thousands of tons, um, hundreds of thousands of trees uh, were um, instantly um, uh, Fallen. Uh, yeah, felled. And there is um, a real problem of how to, uh, the community had to make a very significant investment in either choosing to either let them rot on the side of the mountain or um, uh, storing them and drying them in order for the wood to be used. So um, this stage was, uh, an opportunity also to kind of give a new life to this um, uh, to this wood um, and to also kind of enact a, a practice that we think is, is is kind of really central to our practice is to kind of be involved in every stage of the uh, production process like going all the way back to this original sourcing of the materials and that's something that's obviously not practical to do um, in a normal supply chain driven um, uh, uh, a typical sort of uh, procurement process, uh, but in um, in smaller projects and projects that are that have as a kind of a primary goal the activation of a network or of um, uh, a community, um, it becomes possible. So then the outcome of that one of the outcomes there were several um, uh, piece, uh, several um, parts of the festival. We design, of, yeah. yeah, the uh, infrastructural elements that will be used um, repeatedly um, over the coming years, and I think in a way that's one of uh, a number of principles that we um, that were in a way the kind of the fruit of a, a process of reflection that um, is I think um, broadly summed up in this book non-extractive architecture which is an ongoing research project into uh, what the, the possibility of a new paradigm in architecture how we could actually replace um, a paradigm that is uh, built on separation uh, on distance between production and consumption on distance between the architect and the community. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I mean, it, it's too long to go into the whole, um, <laughs> all of the uh, elements that we uh, consider to be central to this idea. But uh, yeah, I think these two projects are in a way sort of emblematic of yeah. um, a new relationship to uh, material, a new relationship to uh, constituencies and communities. Um, and. Uh, and in fact, it's um, simply the beginning of a, a process because uh, this is a research that we uh, still currently engage yeah. in and we will be for quite some time. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to be back at AA even yeah, remotely. Rem it, we really wanted to be there yeah. today, but um, it just didn't work out. Thanks so much. Um, I'm handing over to Rana. I'm doing one Zoom to Zoom. Rana, are you uh, to my... Yes. Yes, hello. Okay. Uh, good evening, and thank you for having me a uh, part of this uh, wonderful talk. <laughs> um, I, uh, they have my slides. I don't know. Would, would, you, would you like me to share? or? I'm, I'm, okay. Can you see what okay. I'm saying? It's, yes, That's yes, great. yes okay. great. Uh, I'm probably not going to talk about each slide, but you, you can get them running. Just to say, um, uh, well, there are two things that made me an activist. Uh, my country, uh, living through the war, and uh, the AA, so thank you. <laughs> uh, because when I was at the AA, I, I had to flee the civil war to go to, to do my studies, but what was happening is that my mind was in my country. And I started, uh, 
trying to first uh, uh, try to share with my colleagues and my tutors what Beirut was going through. And this is how the whole thing started, basically. So the first big public installation that I made, if I may call it public, was in the basement at the AA, where I laid down all my work on the grounds and asked people to step on the drawings and to show the ephemerality and how easy we can lose something that is supposed to be our roots. Uh, Rana, would you, so like that, me, would you like me to cycle through your images? Uh, yes, you can. I mean, okay. we, can, we can move to the second one. This one was about just the public installation and why it was so important. And just to talk about it a little is that because uh, what kept Beirut going is the informalities of the city. And these informalities were on, always happening within these spaces in between. Now, uh, to move to this one, uh, I, I don't know if you are all aware of it, but uh, on August 4, 2020, at uh, 18.08, uh, we had an apocalyptic blast that just uh, eradicated the city in less than 38 seconds. And uh, since that event, uh, uh, our approach and our work and everything has changed. It's re it really shook us uh, very deeply. Uh, this is one of the work, and it's the first indoor work uh, ever made. Is about, uh, we called it uh, debris of text and uh, eyeglasses. It's uh, be because we don't have a government, and then we went to the streets to, to help out in, in cleaning the city. But what was happening is that every day when we went down, we would find a pair of eyeglasses. And so we took a picture of this eyeglasses and the way it, it was there. We collected some of the debris that was around it, and we wrote a text uh, as an homage to each one of these pair of eyeglasses because it's a very personal element and yet uh, d deprived from its owner. So we don't know if its owner died or just is there somewhere else. But that there, there was something that, that was very striking about finding these eyeglasses. And we did this installation. It is now running in Dresden uh, in collaboration with the Kunsthaus. And uh, we just installed it. I mean, I was there a week, uh, a week ago. Um, and underneath it, well, it's my portrait. This is me in the luggage. Uh, and this is how I feel lately. I feel faceless and I feel like I'm simple limbs that no one could really correlate or, or even talk with me because I've lost that something. And uh, since we, we did this performance of Pist over there, and that, I think it's a perfect image that the photographer of the of the Kunsthaus took it and I thought it would be great to to start with it um, and so this this is this is where we stand now but just to say if I am to continue about the kind of work that uh, I do is basically all comes from the streets of Beirut uh, and everything that we learned from Beirut and we took it to other cities because we, we, we became sensitive in a different manner of reading cities. And again, this is in Dresden that we installed last week. And this one is about history is not set in stone. We called it this way. It's a kind of a scrabble so people can move the stones and do whatever they, they want with it. So we had amazing phrases coming out from the public and amazing insults too, which was as, uh, as important, I think, because this is how they felt about it. Uh, but the idea of that history is not set in stone because actually the fragility of and the ephemerality of what we're going through uh, in our uh, side of the, of, of, uh, of the earth, let's say. Um, and this is a, just another simple example of how we were making uh, our, how we were claiming our rights on the streets of Beirut before the economic crisis and before the blast. That was in 2018, where we went down with the students and we start claiming our right to simply park because we were losing these simple things due to the extreme privatizations that was happening in the city. 
And just by taking this plastic chair and sitting on it and having the tag of the, of the counter of the parking lot, we could not let the valet parking intimidate anyone or push us away to, uh, to, uh, to park the, the cars that they were bringing over. And the citizens of this Marum Khayel area were very happy. They came and they stood by us and they joined forces so they could claim their right to park under their own houses instead of having these parking lots taken for, for one of these events that they believe were more important than the citizens living there. Uh, so just a simple example of what uh, the work used to be. Um, I'm saying used to be because now it's changing. It's changing after the blast. Everything is changing, even our mindset and the way we need the transitory space for Beirut is totally different. Uh, this is another project that we did in 2016 in, uh, in the harsh uh, public uh, park that we have in Beirut that was closed for 32 years after it got burned and bombarded in 1982 by the uh, Israelis. And when it opened, it opened with the kind of a sectarian limits where they decided to cut it geographically between two different uh, sects. And one area was very filthy, but it has a playground. The other area was very posh, but with no playground. So we decided to bring the seesaw on the lock of that door because the, the children will just jump uh, the fence to be able to play. So we were able to erase that fence uh, thanks to the, to the uh, children playing. Uh, and of course, uh, they were not very happy about it. Uh, I'm already at seven minutes. Do you want me to continue? Yeah, why, why not? <laughs> Because we said five. <laughs> Just this is another thing about how we are able to read cities differently from others. This is in Wellington, uh, in New Zealand, where the minute we landed there, after uh, within three weeks, we realized that there was something off about the city. It was unsettled because of what was happening between the Maori and the Kiwis and how the Maori has been totally er eradicated from their own uh, city uh, by the Kiwis. And we wanted to bring that up front uh, about the water streams that are, that are missing and the amount of homeless that were uh, on the streets. And by just doing this simple performance all day long, uh, it's now in 2022, we did that in 2017, that the government is really reconsidering bringing back the streams out uh, uh, on the streets. And it's happening because we did this installation. So just to say, after, after five years, the, uh, we, I, I hope that they, they are going to do it. But, but I got the letter that it's going to happen. That was a simple example in 2001, where the, uh, the authorities decided that the Théâtre de Beirut, which was the only theater that was running during the civil war and had all the stories of what was happening during the civil wars and these plays were, were happening there, that this place could no longer be because they didn't want to hear any criticism about the political uh, um, framework that we're living in. So they decided that they need to close the theater. So we kidnapped a chair and we had it cut in two along a one month time. And what happened is that we had 4,000 people interested in coming to see how the chair has been cut in two. And we would tell them the story of the theater. They would go into the theater. They see what, what it is all about. And through that installation, we were able to give it 18, life, 18 months of lifespan and uh, to enjoy the theater and to know more about it. So there was a kind of an awareness about that theater that uh, came. Uh, and we had the publication that we had to auto-censor, of course. And uh, that's it. That, this is my, my place. And I just want to say to AL, congratulations to become, to be claimed a terrorist organization. <laughs> and you should be very proud of that. <laughs> Okay, Fantastic. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ilika. You're on one, you're on yourself, you're here. I'm there, yeah. okay. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to keep this short because I think <laughs> we're kind of running out of time. Um, my practice could best be described, I guess, as putting weird objects uh, in public spaces unannounced and largely uncommissioned. Um, and I kind of do this, and I've actually, when I was looking for images for this, I found I've doing, I, mean, I think I've been doing this too much. <laughs> Pretty much everything I do ends up on the streets in one way or another. Um, I guess I see the street as my site and also as my audience um, in some way. Um, so as somebody who's actually um, more of an artist than an architect, sorry, I'm coming out in front of some of them, some ex-students who probably thought I was an architect, but I'm not really. Um, I feel that sculpture is quite a good tool to um, investigate, look at, and intervene in urban space. Um, and I use um, these objects to kind of materialize things that I'm really kind of wondering about myself, and I think maybe some people in the public are wondering about this too. So these things might be uh, government policies. This is a kind of healthy eating five a day thing, um, which appeared in Edinburgh. Um, and what I really love, although it's absolutely hard, uh, about working in this way is that it's really difficult. Um, so um, unlike uh, museum audiences or gallery audiences who are sort of well versed in being polite uh, about your work, um, I guess the public's take on what I do is often quite confrontational. Um, and I'm quite um, interested in that, although sometimes I find it difficult. Um, and a lot of these things, uh, yeah, are also to do with the kind of social role of art or the way in which um, people engage with it. Um, these are objects that are made for uh, places in Berlin and in London uh, to be vandalized um, and to sort of detect um, and uh, inspire sort of antisocial behavior. So we're kind of trying to find out things about a space by putting an object there. Um, sometimes they become uh, sort of uh, props for activism or, um, yeah, part of protest um, in, again, kind of trying to materialize things like government changes in policy uh, relating to the benefit system um, or um, more recently, um, this is where I live in Wolfenstow, um, charting things to do with regeneration. So these are all the people, um, the decision makers um, who have decided to privatize a third of the public space where I live. So in a way, let's say I use these objects to uh, ask and uh, ask questions or answer questions to myself, but I do that in a very public way. Um, the most recent thing I'm working on um, is in collaboration or working in parallel with Architects for Social Housing, um, trying to find ways in which sculpture can become a sort of tool to pre um, present counter evidence um, as part of a, a, a campaign to save um, social housing. Um, I can only tell you that if you're trying to do any of these things, uh, sculpture is a really bad thing to put in public spaces. And if you want to visualize something, don't do it by logging big objects around spaces mm -hmm. because it's a bit awkward. Um, I'm obviously joking, but um, yeah, I think it's a really fascinating way of um, intervening um, in, in spaces. I think that's me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yudika. Um I'm going to finish this off with a bit of a response from, from you, who are in some ways taking a, a kind of responsibility for the way in which we might be having these conversations in the future <laughs> within the context of an educational setting. Um, I, I, I'm, as I said before, I'm fascinated to bring this conversation together around issues of documentation, which is obviously key to the way in which we describe what we do as students, as architects, um, the scale at which that can operate across scales when it comes to something like film, Liam. And then there's something, when I first put this together, I had this idea of a family tree and what the value of that might be. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sort of, I don't want to get caught up in that. And you know, I think yesterday, Mark Wigley was talking about the ghosts and the sort of the weight of the ghosts in the room. And I think we mustn't be burdened with that. But I think there's a, a fantastic array of approaches to the way in which we might treat the importance the danger of documentation in some cases, or the risk that is taken within. But I want to hand over to you, because I'm, I know you are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ingrid. And uh, thank you to everyone at the, the AA who um, 
put together this um, interesting symposium. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to be a little out of guard because I don't have any slides. So you actually have to listen to me. Um, for those who know, don't know me, uh, my name is Muiwa, Muiwa Oki, um, and I am the RIBA president-elect uh, to 2020, and will be president um, from next September. And when I was introduced to this um, talk, um, the, the basis of it was to um, to talk about where where should where should we be answer the question where should we be active, and um, in the context of um, uh, space and streets, and I believe my sort of activism and one of the reasons I'm here is uh, the very somewhat parochial in the fact that it's it's narrow to the the idea of me as a architectural worker. Um, being active in my community of architects and uh, and campaigning and championing for a different type of um, architect, a different type of architecture, um, and uh, what that should look like within an institution like the RIBA. And um, what that has led to with to me and is is sort of a a conversation about how to disrupt uh, institutional power. And um, the one key takeaway I'd, I'd, I'd sort of say here is, you know, just being bold, uh, because there's opportunity out there. And um, the, the boldness that you have um, sort of uncovers the missing links, the missing links within architectural history, theory, and professional practice and how that translates into the, the built environment. One of my key points when I was running for uh, RIBA president was the idea of inclusion, including the different facets of how um, we could practice architecture and study architecture. Um, and the wonderful panelists here have shown us how they do that um, in the different guises all the way from since the 1960s Till now, and um, I think that is a that's a, that we are in a interesting time where we have to reimagine what we want from architecture, and in that respect, what we see an architect to be doing. From a personal personal point of view, there is quite a lot of um, uh, snobbishness when it comes to uh, what an architect does. Um, and it's in my understanding and what I want to achieve in the next two years, or start a conversation of achieving in the next two years, is um, freeing ourselves to um, uh, 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 reimagine and redefine what that should look like in professional practice as well as in academia. And I know in the AA, even though I, wasn't, I haven't been, I'm not an alumni of the AA, there has, that conversation has, um, Always been happening, and I think there is a, there is a, is a there is a, a need and, and, and um, uh, a value in connecting what's happening at these uh, cultural institutions and speaking to the wider public about it. Um, because the reason why inclusion matters because, is because I believe, and I'm sure everyone here would. Um, agree with me that inclusion um, matters because it's a basic human need. And when I want to define what inclusion is, I, I come to the point where I, I, I am talking about an, an environment where um, we're in a productive space, where people are working together towards a, a common goal. And that is where I believe the RIBA is or should be bring in these connections from the AA, Bartlett, University of Sheffield, and other um, uh, professional uh, bodies together to solve a common goal. And one of the common goals that I and most of us in, 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 in the world now face, the challenges that we face, an opportunity that we face, is 
with uh, the environmental and ecological collapse. And there is a, there is a, a need for architects, however we want to define ourselves, to actually challenge in a very um, clear, concise way and create some value in solving that problem. And that's the major issue and one of the biggest things that I want to sort of leave you with, is like how in, in some ways are we serving that conversation to solve the issue of climate collapse because that's the big issue of our time. Um, and in what way, in what facet are we defining ourselves as architects to do that? Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm gonna leave my comments very minimal. I just want to say, throwing some comments out there because I really want to get uh, questions and whatever from the audience. <coughs> I'm curious about this question of um, solving problems because I think from a perspective of teaching, I always tell people not to try and solve problems because it, it has a very finite and often impossible task. Um, and I'm then curious when we come to say someone like Liam, whether the work you're doing is problem solving or in fact quite something different and where that fits into contending with this very difficult issue at a range of scales, a range of projected timelines and a range of, I think stepping outside what it is that we do as a national body, which is a really interesting question, um, there's an extended conversation also because I think RBA is a, a dysfunctional trade union um, that represents little. I'm not going to have this argument here, but uh, we can continue, I hope, over the coming years. Um, so what should we be represented for? So there's a bunch of questions out there. I hope that we can take a first question from the audience. Yes. Fascinating. There was a question on Monday, and I, I must ask the panelists for it to be snappy. And here's your question. What should an architect contribute to society? Ooh. Maybe we collect a few more questions. <laughs> yes, that's, OK. How about we do three questions, and then we come back to them all? I think what's interesting is that, um, yes. This question over here. Uh, hi, this is a question probably any of the panelists could answer, but it's aimed at Graham. Uh, you, you've witnessed a series of ruptures in architectural education through your career, which are really important. Um, what is the next rupture, and how can we bring it on? Ruptures. What, say, say it again, please. What's what? the next rupture, and how can we bring it on? Oh, we just had it, uh, COVID. It accelerated everything. Uh, enormously and made people much more aware of um, how the systems work, uh, the role of media and in uh, remote communication, all sorts of things that seem futuristic have come into play. Plus they really, really made like temporary hospitals and all of this kind of thing that you'd never imagine you'd see in your lifetime happen and jails people taken out of the jails because they were infected places and released into the street i mean the whole world was turned upside down temporarily and isn't going back so i would say that was a really big rupture but uh, knowing ed who is asking the question uh, <laughs> um it's a beautiful question uh, i think you know, we live in capitalism. There's always going to be a rupture and everlasting. And we have as architects to be always alert and to be seeking to begin again and to make a better social justice through our work. And it's a horrible task. I mean, it's not just aesthetics of the, you know, the bow window. It's a whole other way of thinking that you need to develop. I recommend uh, Ed's book, by the way. <laughs> you can be more specific if you like. I you can't remember the title. <laughs> <laughs> I've started reading it, and actually just to compliment him, it's all about Elephant and Castle and the destruction of the market there. Mm. And I used to go there to see the old movies, like in the old days, sorry to go on about this, you would, you would work so hard at the AA and all night and all the rest of it, and then you'd miss the films 
but the Elephant and Castle Odeon, about three months later, would be running the latest film, and you could pick it up in the, the now demolished uh, shopping mall. Okay, sorry. Oh, thank you. Hi, I have a question. Um, my name is Christian. I'm a first year here, and uh, prior to coming here, I studied urban planning at Ohio State, and um, my colleague at the geography department actually wrote an article, published an article about surveillance, which Liam alluded to earlier, um, at Black Lives Matter protests in the United States. Um, and I wanted to ask if you came into contact with that and how the built environment helps these institutions that surveil um, minority people and things like that. And this could also be to anyone else. Are we still collecting questions, or is that a strategy um, to avoid me, answering the yeah. question? Was, I think it was partly a strategy not to answer your question, I'm afraid, in some ways, because uh, just to explain, it's, it's a little, I remember when we had the presentation week, and so I think someone asked my favorite book. Um, John, I don't know you'll remember some of these questions. The favorite anything, or the definitive answer on how you make change when you have eight, nine people is going to be an all-night task, if not several days. Um, Go, go for it, Liam. Right. Um, uh, so then, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, the, the design of the built environment is totally complicit in the design of the systems that surveil those who occupy it. Um, I, I, I haven't encountered that article that you, that you mentioned. Um, uh, I mean, there's a whole lot of scholarship that's happening ar around that subject right now, which I think is really important. People like the Algorithmic Justice League that, that comes out of the MIT Media Lab. Um, uh, that turned into a Netflix documentary as a way of kind of foregrounding the embedded contradictions and biases that exist in the types of data sets that currently rule our world, right? Like what we're seeing happening is a radical shift in power structures where a lot of the, the, the mechanisms that used to, used to structure our occupation of urban space have become outsourced to proprietary algorithms. We're, we're now it, it perhaps better describe us as customers of our cities as opposed to citizens, um, where systems of governance are now um, uh, pervaded by institutions accountable to shareholders as opposed to um, institutions accountable to a, to a public that might democratically elect them. And that kind of shift has sort of happened um, in plain sight, but but without much um, contest. Um, it's just sort of seeped in through the margins under the guise of efficiency and practicalities. And I think it's totally the, the remit of what architects sh should be starting to explore, which is, I guess, why we make the work that we, we make. And maybe this is a way of coming back to that first question, which is to say that um, I, I totally think it's the it's the responsibility of architects and designers to explore those issues because the forces that used to govern and, and shape our experience of space and cities now to a large extent e exist beyond the, the the remit that architects once had you know like like the the, the main um, spheres of, of public discourse is not the piazza or the square or the urban street but rather is um, uh, platform urbanism and uh, it's not structured by uh, a, a government that we might elect, but rather the rules of a dude in hoodies and sneakers. Um, so architects, if they want to remain effective, as opposed to like dissolving into an increasingly rarefied luxury industry, um, needs to find ways to be effective and find ways to operate within those, those systems. Um, and at the same time, in a school like this, we also need to be like being real about what it is that people do when they leave. Mm. And I think a lot of the work that we might have been talking about previously existed on the margins or what we used to think of the margins of the profession. But now I think it's firmly in the square center. And to a large extent, those people that do graduate and go off and follow the traditional route, becoming an intern, moving their way up, becoming an associate, I think that is now the margins of practice um, as people find other ways to architect <coughs> in different spheres, um, mm. and really it's just a struggle to become relevant. So, so maybe the RBA can start to acknowledge the different forms of architect that, that now exist um, mm. beyond the, those that make buildings as singular objects. Yeah. I, 
there's, I know there's many questions. If we can, could we do a gathering of two or three again? Say three questions, if there are three. Because I think also, Ayal, you might have some comments on the last question, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> um, hello. Um, thanks for the lovely um, lecture. Um, what are the initial changes we can make to introduce climate-friendly design into domestic architecture, and how do we bring the climate emergency through architecture into the foreground of public knowledge? Okay. Um, there, was there another hand up, just so we gather a couple of questions? Hello, um, so my question is, is there a tipping point in architecture? Tipping point being the fine line between um, the past and, or currently the present and the future. Okay, so we, I, I feel we still have an issue of surveillance. Um, we have, I'm summarizing badly, climate crisis in relation to domestic change. Am I rephrasing this wrongly? And I missed the first half of your question, but the relationship between the, the present and the future in relation to architecture. Hmm. Are we getting one more? Are I we think we'll gonna state, hit it? What, what oh, do do? John, okay. Hi. Oh. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the role of humour in some of the projects because there's some really amazing serious stuff but also some really funny objects and that is obviously done on, pur on purpose. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really powerful and I wanted to know how important humour is in some of the work across the table. Maybe that's an interesting way of addressing some of the other questions. The challenge accepted, anyone? Right, good segue, yeah. Okay. I mean, to me, humour is obviously quite important. I'm sure that was aimed at me. Um, and I think it's to do with making people question their assumptions. So I think a lot of stuff is assumed to be X, Y, and Z because we've learned that and we are told so and whatever. So. For me, I often address quite serious things, for instance, in the current thing where it's about people losing like 2,000 homes. It's quite a serious question and it's on the ground and these people are there. Um, they're not laughing about it, we're not laughing about it, but unless you sort of unhinge some of the um, kind of assumed forms of representation, you will not get anything moving. That's my position. So how do I do that? Um, I can uh, read them some data and I can tell them some really scary figures about how their rent levels are going up. Um, that's fine, other people do that too. Um, what can I do that's different? And how do, how do I get something across in a different way? And I think humour, and thanks for picking up on it, is, um, is very powerful in that. Graham, what do you take, what's your take on humour? Uh, no, uh, uh, I've always been very uh, satirical and a bad student. So, yeah, humor is really, really important. And um, I liked your sausage roll and all the chickens and things. I thought they were that. But anyway, the, it could be. Uh, it could be. <laughs> Did I see the wrong slides? <laughs> OK, <laughs> whoops. Anyway, uh, no, I think it's really important that humor opens the side door so that you can look at things in a different kind of way. And um, it gives you some latitude to play even if you're dealing with death and surveillance um, you do need this other space for some kind of conversation which we're in now and humor is part of it I don't really like violent humor it's I'm very a little bit puritanical and not there's some of the humor that's out there that my kids like that I really can't deal with it, you know. But uh, what is humor? And But comedy's always been part of it. Uh, sat satire, comedy, and the serious um, operation. 
I was thinking that we should ask Matthew Gandhi about the domestic and ecology thing, if he's out there still. I don't know. I, I'm still here. I, and, and I, I just, um, actually, um, I was listening to that, the question about the humour, actually, because I, I really like those objects that Julika was um, talking about, and I, my random thought was, could we have a, either a portable fracking kit or like a, an object in honour of Liz Truss or something, which could be interesting. I don't know what it would be, but uh, it could be interesting. Is that, is that a commission, Matthew? Yeah, well, or, or, or not commission, perhaps. Yeah, more likely, but... <laughs> I just, um, Rana, I, I, you wanted to come in. I, I also, I think there's a conversation with you and with Ayal about absurdity also within your respective situations. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to, just to continue on the same uh, uh, topic, uh, if, if we're not playful in what we do, at least uh, in Beirut, uh, we could never let a message go through. Uh, so it's, it's so playfulness and humor is very important. Uh, and, and I think uh, to go back to how we contribute to society, I think by simply putting the story or the event or whatever is happening out there, is really a lot of contribution because the people, when the people know, things changes. And, and we've seen that in, in, in Beirut. Uh, the minute they're informed, something happens. And, and we saw it happening when we had the revolution in 2019. A lot of people came for more information about some specific, specific sites where we went and we, and we gathered and we had uh, uh, sit-ins. Uh, so a, a narrative, people seem to not to forget about it. When something happens in an intense manner, even if it disappears, the story stays, it sticks in their, in their mind and they go for it. So, so the collective of these events definitely have an impact. So I think this is the, the contribution in, in the absurdity of the world that we're living in from uh, 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 our point of view. Would you agree, Ayo? <laughs> I guess I want to talk about, um, go back to the question of surveillance and, you know, your proposition, Liam, that, you know, we're no longer in physical space, but in some kind of algorithmic media space. And, and kind of say that as long, you know, I've, I've studied here for 12 years and speaking about family trees, I have, I think, three of my tutors still in the room. Peter, <laughs> Kathy, and, and Carlos, and I, you know, in a sense, I, I think that, I, you know, th th my experience of going through the AA is that every single year we would say there is no longer free real space. We are, you know, in television, video, in the internet. You know, it's like, and um, my experience is is a, is a just much more nuanced and complex interaction between physical space media space and ecological environmental climate so you know this is a kind of a much more intricate inter in interchange that is going on and I'll, I'll demonstrate it with three very brief uh, uh, examples so when when we started forensic architecture and I should say you know it's a sort of a counter forensic agency we uh, we do analysis of complex scenes we realize actually the the way, the, the biggest um, realization we kind of fell upon is that in an environment of, you know, multiple media around a particular incident, uh, the only way that you can actually analyze and look at videos is through building architectural models. A space and architecture became like an optical device. The only way to synchronize very partial view collected simultaneously around an incident. And, and those incidents we started with back in 2011 um, had one, two, later maybe five videos around it. One of the most recent investigations that we've done together with social movements in Hong Kong um, on trying to understand, to map out those 
protest had thousands and thousands of videos, and the videos were not short anymore. They were hours long, live streamed. And we had to combine, and you know, Nicola Zambeshi is here who was working on this. We had to combine algorithmic way of looking at it, kind of sieving through it, through artificial intelligence, flagging certain objects, certain uh, attempt to identify the street corners, etc. Um, and then, you know, our researchers would build a story around it. And the story that we found was not really the story of people. It was a story of air and the way that in which the um, protest uh, and social movement in, in Hong Kong played out is um, by the tear gas gathering in streets, reacting to a very extreme topography a very kind of extreme division of water and land and mountain and, 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 and depressions. Uh, and in that, very extreme extrusion of architecture, which created very nonlinear movement of the cloud. So effectively, imagine trying to find thousands of videos and paste together a single object, which is the cloud and the way it moves through the city and the way it connects communities in one neighborhood in Kualun with other, um, and, uh, and in fact, triggering as it goes, empathy for the movement, right? So again, you see a kind of like a, an environmental object, which is, you know, sort of like hot air mixed with all sort of fluid dynamics and the CS gas uh, kind of moving uh, through the city, creating an ephemeral architecture uh, that is a political space because it created a commons. You know, we think about commons as good things, no? Like I don't know, water, air, sky. This was a negative commons, but whoever was in there, whoever was the citizen of that cloud, was somehow triggered into action in a particular way. So, and th this is one. The second is an investigation we undertake right now on uh, a very, you know, kind of old and painful historical event, and that is the. Um, the colonial genocide, the German colonial genocide in Namibia, 1904 to 1908, uh, of the Nama and Herero people, and we're working for the for the for the Herero um, uh, Genocide Memorial Foundation, and we have understood. Um, so we're looking, as we do, at you know hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, photographs from that period. But rather than look at what's happening at the foreground of each one of those images, each one of those images include a very, very long trapezoid of space, somehow showing us really deep into the desert, and become the last remaining meteorological sensors, if you like. That's the, you know, when you don't have data about the environment, we could see that the, the, the German genocide in Namibia is a kind of a catastrophic environmental event that has transformed the environment. And this is by mapping the trees and identify the grasses and bushes in each one of them and spatially locating them and comparing them to what is uh, today. So I just wanted to say that I think that, you know, like in the same way that we you know, you can use social media spatially, you can use those colonial archives and create a certain relation between media space and, you know, the kind of environment that, that is held by it. Not much humor there, sorry. No, no, I think it's quite okay. I, I'm conscious in the, in the, in the spirit of, of fair labor that um, Ben here has, this is his third night on, so we'll, we will need to wrap up. I, I'm encouraging you all to stay on and have some clusters of conversations. We have drinks as well, but as just as a as a, as a wrapping up comment, and one of the reasons that I thought of putting these ideas together, I mean, all of this comes from my understanding of unit agendas, what's been present in the school. Um, I've had many conversations with Carlos over the years, and I've had the pleasure of working with many of his, his offspring, um, many of whom have gone on to take ideas of action, direct or in, indirect, um, to other schools of architecture. And so much of the conversation around participatory practice comes out of a lot of the Dip 10 thinking. And as well as you know, many other people who have then come towards a sort of political awareness that is enacted through a kind of architecture or that broadening, broadened 
interpretation of architecture. And the other is, you know, you, John and Anne Sophie, who sort of introduced me perhaps for the first time to the, the zooming out and the, the value of the kind of observation that we do and the loaded, provocative, and propositional nature of how we observe. And I think these are two important scalar strands that really run as a very, very strong vein through the school and manifest in very different ways and have tremendously different implications for how we work. So I think it was a really good opportunity to just bring those things to the fore, um, to understand that they also have a past, as well as, in many cases, um, a, a very kind of new interpretation through what you guys are doing in Space Caviar. So this is this series of generations that are interpreting various themes, obviously, in a range of different ways, but come back to how we take action. And the value of that action is no less significant, be it at the level of governance or be it at the level of how people abuse a kind of redolent object within the street. And I think also to have you here is tremendously important. I, I apologize for the, the, uh, the provocation and then, then an end point to that kind of conversation. I really hope we continue to have this because there's nothing more hopeful than to have someone who has come as, a, as an architectural worker, you, you are not in your 60s retiring from your architectural profession. This is you know, a new voice within a very old institution. And I, I'm very excited to have you here and very excited to have you round the corner. Um, so um, tomorrow night we'll carry on, uh, but please do stay, have a drink, gather around our panelists um, and carry on the conversation. And thank you so much for coming and thank you to our panel.